and that their that their kids allow them to um, allow their parents to follow them and, and follow their activity online. And so, even if you're not monitoring that uh, second by second, your kids know that uh, that at some point their parents will be aware of what's happening online. That that's one way to to manage that risk. But uh, obviously, the uh, the president's children have a special uh, risk associated with their involvement in social media. Right. That you know, a, a, a regular child out there who does who says something that they shouldn't say on the internet uh, could be embarrassing to them or to their social circle. Uh, but obviously, the, um, the the first family is under substantially more scrutiny than that. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to take one question from uh, we have uh, on from uh, one of our our viewers, Alyssa in D.C raises an interesting point. We've dealt a lot with how new technology uh, these days uh, is, and the government interact with each other, whether Secretary Clinton's emails, for example, are subject to FOIA requests. And she wants to know, how should the government grapple with a FOIA request for what we're doing now? I mean, all of your emails are required to become public record, but yeah. it, do, it does, is the White House, do you think that there's gonna be an imperative for you to figure out how to keep something like this so that it's available as a government record? Yeah. Uh, this is something that government lawyers do spend a lot of time thinking about. This is true of my Twitter feed, to take one example, that all of my tweets and all the people who tweet at me, that that, that, that information is retained by the federal government. It's saved and it is considered a, a government record. So our tweet of this meerkat here today is a government record. In fact, it is. <laughs> and well, we'll be subject to uh, people having an opportunity to take a look at it in the future. Now, the difference is that obviously the, uh, uh, any tweet that is sent along these lines is something that's public anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are, there, it does raise a lot of questions about uh, government records and transparency and something that our, our lawyers uh, grapple with a lot. I mean, and I, and I think this is a challenge for the government. This is obviously uh, a very different uh, kind of challenge than a private company would have to, to face, right? That there wouldn't be the same kind of expectation that people would have that that company is saving all of their records so that the American public could look at them. Uh, so, you know, the standard that uh, Secretary Clinton was held to in terms of retaining her email and making them public uh, is certainly higher than the standard that you would expect of a private sector CEO. Okay. Uh, but again, that's, uh, that also, I think, is why um, Secretary Clinton deserves some credit for asking the State Department to release all of her emails. And do you have any advice uh, as a White House that's experimented so much with all these new technologies for Secretary Clinton as she makes a foray into campaigning in this new media age? Yeah. Well, look, there, there are going to be lots of experts there. I don't, I don't know that she uh, or her team made any advice from me. But I, I think as a general matter, what I would say is that there is always risk associated with new technology and that sometimes there are unintended consequences associated with using new technology to deliver a message or to communicate with the public. I think what I have learned over the course of the last six or eight years working for, the, for then Senator Obama and his campaign and then working here at the White House is that the risk is almost always worth it. Uh, it doesn't mean that every time you try to do a meerkat interview or do something uh, <laughs> so far so good, so far so good, uh, or that you try to do something new on Twitter, it doesn't mean it's going to work every time. Right. But I do think that there's enough upside that it's worth the risk, and that I hope. Uh, and and here's here's the other thing. I think that the political process itself will benefit from a situation in which you have candidates seeking to use new technology to try to better engage their uh, their supporters and their. Uh, prospective voters. That is a general. That is overall a good thing for our system. And so, uh, I hope Secretary Clinton and everybody who's considering a national campaign uh, will uh, uh, consider new technology as an opportunity to do something new and different, and to embrace that opportunity as opposed to seek to shield themselves from it. Well, before we wrap up this historic meerkat, I want to take one more question uh, from our viewers here. Um, someone has asked about Benjamin Netanyahu, who spoke yesterday to M NBC's Andrew Mitchell. Mm -hmm. um, you've said that you're going to reassess uh, the relationship and the, your position toward Israel-Palestine, the two-state solution. I'm wondering, in light of the Israeli elections and what's gone on, are you going to reassess uh, whether or not the U.S. would support Palestinians making a unilateral, unilateral excuse me, bid for statehood at the United Nations? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Casey, I should start out by saying that there's one aspect of our, of our relationship with Israel that will not be reevaluated, and that is the strong history of uh, significant security cooperation between our two countries. And whether that's the military military relationship between the US and Israel or uh, the relationship between our intel agencies, uh, that that kind of uh, security cooperation will continue because those relationships and that cooperation is essential to the security of the Israeli people. And that is something that the president continues to be fully committed to. Uh, I know that this is something, you know, Prime Minister Netanyahu has previously said that that cooperation under President Obama has been unprecedented mm -hmm. uh, in its strength and depth, and that will continue. 
Uh, what uh, is also true, though, is Prime Minister Netanyahu, over the course of the campaign, just a couple of days before the election, uh, indicated uh, that he, frankly, was not prepared to live up to the kinds of commitments that previous Israeli prime ministers had made to trying to reach a two-state solution to resolve the conflict between the Israeli people and the Palestinian people. And the problem with that is that for years now, it has been the policy of the United States under both Democratic and Republican presidents that a two-state solution is the best way to resolve the conflict in the Middle East. This is not just something that's been supported by Democratic and Republican presidents over the years. This is something that has long been supported by Democratic and Republican members of Congress. Just last December, uh, a resolution passed the House of Representatives with unanimous support by voice vote indicating support for a two-state solution. So the prime minister's withdrawal from commitments to that solution is uh, troubling because it does uh, go against what has been the, the bedrock of U.S. policy toward the region. Now, when we have previously raised concerns about unilateral actions at the UN, mm -hmm. we have raised those concerns over the objection of other members of other members of the international community, including our allies in Europe, by saying, "Look, uh, we shouldn't impose a solution on the Israelis and Palestinians from the UN. What we should do is we should uh, ask the Israelis and the Palestinians to sit down at the negotiating table, work together toward a two-state solution, and not try to impose one from the outside." And the fact is now that our closest ally in those talks has indicated that they're not interested in trying to reach a resolution like this. It, it calls into question our justification for taking those kinds of actions at the UN. So, so you might reassess whether you would support a unilateral bid. Well, I think it causes us to rethink our broader strategy for trying to resolve this situation. And uh, this is not something uh, that is going to happen over the course of a day or two, mm -hmm. uh, but rather moving forward, we're going to rethink uh, how our policy toward the region uh, is expressed as we um, make decisions about policy at the UN and other situations where we are working with uh, other countries around the globe to address the conflict in the region. Okay, and I'm going to close with um, uh, an equally serious question, which is to say, have you filled out your bracket and who do you have <laughs> picked for the national champion? That's a good question. I may look a little bleary-eyed this morning because I stayed up a little later than I should have watching basketball <laughs> last night. I didn't get a chance to watch much during the day, so I tried to make up for that a little bit last night. Uh, I have, in my bracket, I have picked Arizona to win. Arizona. Uh, and cool. my thinking is simply this, <laughs> that I have not watched as much college basketball uh, over the season as I typically do, will, will have done. So I don't have as much confidence in sort of the early round picks, so by trying to distinguish myself in the later rounds by choosing Arizona to win, that that might give me a a bit of a comparative a competitive like advantage. We'll now, see. do you all participate in a pool here in the White House, all the staffers? Is the president in the pool? Uh, there is an informal uh, arrangement here where people, uh, some of my colleagues, without the money changing hands, will <laughs> uh, engage in a good natured competition uh, about who can fill out the best bracket. And the president's entry that he filled out with uh, Andy Katz from ESPN will be, will be included. Uh, included there. Now, the real problem for my bracket is that I chose. Uh, Iowa State to make it to the Final Four, and as we know, they were the victim of one of the many upsets yesterday. I so. also have been hurt by Iowa State's loss. <laughs> so.